the second ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political, non-religious foundation, under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including the country's major universities, and I thank the University of Science Malaysia and its Vice Chancellor, Professor Tansli Dato Zulkifli Abdul Razak, for hosting our event today. Having started in November 2008, Bridges is being continuously held in Malaysia and Thailand until April 2009, involving the participation of Nobel laureates and other eminent keynote speakers. The second ASEAN series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows the series of 300 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand and in the Philippines since 2003. 30 Nobel laureates, as well as 13 other keynote speakers and artists such as Dr. Hans Blix, Damanita Roddick, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, Jesse Norman, and Dr. James Wolfenson participated in these events. In Thailand, they were presided over by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit and Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Maha Chakri Sirithorn, and they reached an audience of 90,000 participants. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as a single conference, but as an ongoing series of events in which Nobel laureates and international decision makers have built strong bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. The basis for peace being education and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 88 other national and international institutions, including 33 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of bridges in Thailand and the Philippines and of the events in Malaysia reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness, and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and our environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, Bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts by developing innovative forms of cooperation and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. A globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. So let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer. An opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected, and comprehensive view of ourselves and the world in which we live, and which we are able to create anew constantly through dialogues towards a culture of peace which needs the participation of everyone. I thank Professor Roger Kornberg, the 2006 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, who has agreed to come to Malaysia to support the events. We now look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you. Thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, my Special thanks to the Vice Chancellor for both the invitation uh, to participate in this event uh, and for warm hospitality. Uh, also, uh, may I express my appreciation to Mr. Uwe Morowitz, uh, the inspiration behind the event and 
whose tireless efforts uh, toward an end that uh, we all so very much desire uh, is the ultimate purpose. Now, uh, first I should explain uh, what I present on the first slide is a uh, shortened version, a summary statement of the title, uh, and it will be apparent uh, why I summarize in this way as I go along. Some of you may have read the literature uh, produced by the International Peace Foundation, and in particular you may have seen a recent contribution uh, to Bridges by the physicist Sheldon Glashow who commented on the importance of basic science and of serendipity, of chance discovery for technological development and for the benefit of mankind. Uh, Professor Glashow gave examples from physics and he described their impact on engineering. I myself have made similar arguments uh, to those he has done, but in relation to biomedical science, and its impact on human health. And I would like to begin today with biomedical science and then extend the discussion begun by Professor Glashow along several lines, and they will include the following. First, the underlying reason and the indispensable nature of basic, of fundamental research. Secondly, the meaning and the mechanism of serendipity, of chance discovery science. After that, the relationship of science to industry. Then I'll speak about the meaning uh, and the relationship of science to government and to, so and to society. I will mention uh, as well science as it relates to religion and conclude with the implications of all that I have to tell you for cultural accommodation between peoples and peace. Now, I should emphasize right at the outset that my own expertise lies in a very limited area of chemical and biomedical science. I am not a social scientist. My opinions on social matters are entirely personal. Uh, they may be of interest, uh, perhaps even provocative, but they carry no more weight than those of any member of this audience. Now let me turn first to biomedical science, and in particular the history of biomedical science, which I can summarize very briefly. It may surprise the members of this audience to know that biomedical science is only about 100 years old, whereas physics and chemistry began many centuries ago. Human biology was until recently entirely neglected. Human disease, until about 100 years ago, was attributed to an imbalance of humors, and the only treatments were bleeding, violent purgatives, and in uh, the RM, uh, some traditional medicines. Doctors at the time, at least in the West, were not educated men. With the first stirrings of biomedical science, in the West, uh, the president of Harvard at the time, Charles Elliott, proposed adding it to the curriculum of the medical school, to which one of the most influential members of the faculty, a noted surgeon, objected. Uh, he said this would be impossible because very few of the students could read or write. Today, not so very many years later, medical science stands as a triumph of the intellect. It is the greatest frontier for intellectual activity in the future. If, as most of you are aware, the 20th century may be described as an age of physics, then the 21st century is surely the age of biology, and especially the age of human biology. Now, this is not to diminish the ongoing importance of the physical sciences, quite the contrary. The boundaries between scientific disciplines have largely disappeared. We have today a near continuum of science extending from the atomic level all the way to the whole organism. We will one day understand every aspect of human life in chemical and physical terms. And with 
that understanding will come control. Control over disease, control over behavior, including, we hope, intolerance and aggressive behavior. Even control over aging and the future of the human race. Now, the past affords very clear guidelines for accomplishing these ends, for fulfilling this great promise. If I were to ask any member of this audience what were the major advances in medical science over the past century of its meaningful existence, I think almost everyone would make the same list. You would think of x-rays, you would think of antibiotics, you would think of non-invasive imaging for uh, especially magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, important as you know for the early detection of cancer and other conditions. I think most of you would probably include genetic engineering, which is the basis of most new medicines. The list could of course go on. What is important and what I wish to emphasize, all of these medical advances have one thing in common. They were all discoveries made in the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, without any notion of an application, without any idea of curing or preventing disease. The lesson of the past, then, is counterintuitive. It tells us to solve a difficult problem in medical science, don't try and do it directly, but rather, Pursue a curiosity about nature, and good things will follow. Do basic research. Now, I think it's instructive to examine a couple of these examples, x-rays and antibiotics, in more detail. X-rays were discovered by William Rentgen. He was the only child of a textile merchant and a manufacturer in the Netherlands in the 19th century. At age 18, he was expelled from school for refusing to inform on a classmate who had drawn a caricature of a teacher. And in fact, his expulsion was permanent. He was never allowed to go back to school in the Netherlands or in Germany. Nevertheless, because of his passion for science, he went on to an academic career, a successful one, gained the chair in physics at the University of Würzburg. In 1895, he was investigating the external effects of an electrical discharge passed through a cathode ray tube. He noticed a faint hint of light, a shimmering on a fluorescent screen in the back of his laboratory. When he covered the cathode ray tube with black cloth or black cardboard, he still saw, in response to a discharge in the tube, um, light on the fluorescent screen. He realized that a new kind of rays were responsible. He named them X-rays. Everyone else at the time uh, referred to them as Rentgen rays, but being a modest man, he insisted, so today we know, do know them as X-rays. Immediately afterwards, he was interested in what material might block the passage of these rays. He tried holding various materials in front of the cathode ray tube, including a piece of lead. As he did this, he saw an image of the skeleton of his own hand on the, cat on the fluorescent screen. He discovered the possible use of x-rays for medical diagnosis and imaging. X-rays came into use for this purpose within a few years. In 1901, William Rentgen was awarded the first Nobel Prize in Physics. Now let us turn briefly to antibiotics. Many of you, I'm sure, know the famous story about Alexander Fleming and the discovery of penicillin. But you may not know that it was a discovery he made some years before, which really laid the basis for that important finding. Fleming was a professor of bacteriology at St. Mary's Hospital in London, and he was growing a disease-causing bacteria in dishes 
to investigate other properties and try to discover how to combat their effect, the cause um, their causative effect on disease. Uh, one day doing this work, uh, he had a cold and a drop fell from his nose into the dish, and he saw that it killed the bacteria. He traced this effect to a protein in the mucus from his nose, uh, which we now know as lysozyme. It gave him the idea that there could be natural materials uh, that would kill bacteria, and especially disease-causing bacteria. Lysozyme itself, as a protein, was not useful for the purpose. But the idea was in his mind, and then, some years later, in 1928, he noticed that one of his dishes of bacteria had become contaminated with a mold, and all the bacteria were dead. So now, um, he was keen on the idea, perhaps the mold produced an agent that would kill bacteria. Uh, he named the agent penicillin, but he was unable to isolate it because of its instability. And he gave up. He published a paper describing his findings uh, and did not pursue its medical use, and the work was soon forgotten. More than a decade later, at Oxford, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain uh, were investigating lysozyme and what was then uh, known to be its target, the bacterial cell wall. They were interested in how lysozyme worked, and they were inter interested in the nature of the bacterial cell wall. Flory, as it happens, had modest beginnings, humble beginnings, rather like uh, Wilhelm Röntgen. He was the son of a shoemaker in Australia. He had been brought to England on a Rhodes Scholarship because of his skill in tennis. Uh, he rose through the ranks at Oxford and became director of the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology. Now, Ernst Chain was a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany in 1933. He was a musical as well as a scientific genius, and he was the first person that Florey hired in his new school of pathology at Oxford. Uh, the two could not get along at all with one another. They were both temperamental and constantly at odds, but uh, during one brief time when they could uh, communicate and they were in agreement, they both thought that they should broaden their study of lysozyme and its action upon the bacterial cell wall to include other antibacterial agents, which they presumed were other forms of lysozyme. Now, Chain had a photographic memory. He could, remember, he could recall everything he had ever read and he could, in particular, on that occasion, remember having read the obscure paper by Alexander Fleming. Uh, both he and Flory thought that penicillin must be a lysozyme, and so it was a suitable object of their study. Chain soon overcame the problem of instability. He succeeded in isolating penicillin. And he and Flory rapidly appreciated its potential for medical use. Uh, there was a problem that the amount of penicillin available from the mold was very small, not sufficient for medical purposes. And to obtain sufficient quantities, it eventually required the collaboration of literally dozens of institutions, including universities, government agencies in both Britain and the United States, research foundations, and pharmaceutical companies, again, in both Britain and the United States. The result, as you all know, was the eradication of bacterial disease. And for this achievement, Fleming, Flory, and Chain shared the 1945 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Now, these brief historical accounts that I have given you of both X-rays and of penicillin, of antibiotics, I think reinforce the crucial role of basic research, and they also illuminate the process discovery. You can see the work was done by individuals who were free to explore and who would follow the path of science wherever it might lead. All such paths lead ultimately to underlying principles and to the fundamental truths of nature. It's from this knowledge, from such deep understanding, that all practical benefit derives. 
Discovery is the engine of progress. Discovery and its offspring, technology, are all that separate us from our original primitive condition. Discovery is our best hope for advancement in the future. Now, the importance of discovery, um, its medical, its economic, even its military benefits were not lost on government central planners. The problem that they face, the difficulty is, discoveries by their very nature that can't be planned. They can't be anticipated or predicted. They arise by chance from untargeted research. They arise, in the words of Sheldon Glashow, from serendipity, as you've seen in the work of Rentkin and of Fleming and of others. The only way to make them happen is to support many talented individuals in the unfettered, unbridled pursuit of basic knowledge. The importance of this fact, which was so well established in the past century, is unfortunately often forgotten by people in government, by people in industry, who desire both greater and more immediate benefits. I can recall from many years ago before all any of the students in this room were born, uh, the words of then American President Lyndon Johnson, who bemoaned what he called, and I quote, life-saving discoveries locked up in the laboratory. He made a plea for what we today call translational research. This serious and well-intended sentiment was mistaken. Application of existing knowledge is not the limiting factor. Knowledge itself is limiting. To emphasize this point, it is often remarked that we know about 1% of human biology, 1% of what there is to know about the human body. In fact, that's an exaggeration. The true number is less than one-tenth of 1%, as I can prove to you very easily. But consider how enormous have been the benefits to human health and, indeed, to world economy from what little we know, from the 1% or less of human biology that is currently available. And then imagine, how great would be the benefits of knowing the remaining 99.9%? .9%. What more persuasive call to the pursuit of basic research can there possibly be? Now, another lesson from the past relates to the support of basic research, which, as you know, has most often come from government rather than from industry, and for good reason. The timeline of basic research is very long. Fundamental problems take decades to solve. Only the public, only you and I and others like us in the world, with a long-range interest in bettering the human condition, will support such an undertaking. Industry, with a short-term interest in the bottom line, cannot be expected to do so. I would ask, I mean, what CEO, what head of a, an industrial organization could possibly report to his or her board of directors that a major investment has been made in research that may or may not become profitable in 10 or 20 years or longer? Inconceivable. Let me give you, let me, to fix ideas, let me give you a concrete, and I would suggest even a frightening, a sobering example. Pharmaceutical companies developing anti-cancer drugs today are regularly forced to choose between a drug that will cure cancer in a single dose and a drug that must be administered weekly and only prolongs life by a year or two. The management of the companies always makes the right decision on behalf of shareholders and pursues the less effective drug. Now, what I describe here is not an isolated occurrence. I have it in good authority. This occurs on a weekly basis in the best pharmaceutical companies in the world. Government 
acting on behalf of you and I, clearly has a special responsibility and a unique role to play. Now, the return on the investment by government in basic research has been enormous, huge. The eradication of polio, the cure of childhood leukemia, many other diseases have saved vast amounts in treatment and productivity, human productivity, not to mention human suffering. Not only has the return on investment been enormous, but it was very small to begin with. Basic research is cheap. The annual budget for cancer research in the United States today is about $5 billion. And to put that in perspective, it's about 10% of the expenditure in the United States on soft drinks, the annual expenditure on soft drinks. Um, it's less than uh, the cost of one week of the unfortunate war in Iraq. Then the question arises for a country such as Malaysia, or Thailand, where Bridges is based, or in many other parts of the world, why do you we, why do you need to support basic research um, at all? I mean, why not wait for a large country like the United States um, and its rich government to fund the basic research, publish the results, which are, of course, rapidly um, communicated in the scientific literature, and then concentrate on applications? Why shouldn't a smaller nation, as I've said, like Malaysia or Thailand, uh, focus especially on putting these discoveries to use for their military, economic, or other value? The answer I would give you is the importance of leadership and the importance of preserving your own intellectual treasure. Those who create new knowledge unavoidably lead in its application. And I would offer the examples of both high-tech and biotech. Um, I know them particularly because they arose, both high-tech and biotech, uh, nearby where I live, in the San Francisco Bay Area, or nearby Stanford University and the University of California, where the fundamental discoveries were made. Others around the world have, as I've mentioned, joined in the rewards, but the leaders have been far more successful. The Silicon Valley has um, been, as you know, phenomenally profitable. More successful in the past, and also more successful in the future, if you look at the example, for example, of Google that arose only recently. Now, what is of particular importance is not the discoveries or the institutions, but the people. The talent that drives the enterprise. The best and the brightest have come to train in the Bay Area at Stanford and University of California, and they remain there, or they're even attracted there after training elsewhere. It is of utmost importance for other places, other countries, to compete for this talent, to retain their native talent, to recruit talent from uh, elsewhere as well. Such a marketplace for talent is in the best interests of all. A marketplace for the talent of young scientists is the most important thing, not only to retain their talent in the country or in the vicinity, but to encourage them to even do science at all. But the choice of a career in science represents, as many of you know here, a great sacrifice. A passion for science must be weighed against a long period of training, 10 or more years of postgraduate training at very low wages, and then the possibility of no career at all awaiting you at the end. <laughs> now the importance of young scientists, of their entry in the profession, of their pursuit, cannot be overstated. Progress in science, and discovery in particular, is almost always the work of young minds. The marketplace for talent, uh, to which I allude, is both academic and industrial. And I should add a disclaimer to what I have just reported. Um, by emphasizing the crucial role of government and the support of science, I do not mean to diminish the significance 
uh, don't mean, I don't wish to demean the role of industry. On the contrary, I've already mentioned the important contribution made by pharmaceutical companies in the development of penicillin and its vital medical use. Um, and that is not an isolated example. It's rather an illustration of what is a time-honored process for drug development. Industry has been and will always remain mostly responsible for translation research, for translating discoveries made in academic laboratories into commercially viable technologies. The time scale for industrial development may be shorter, but the financial scale is not smaller. A pharmaceutical company today will typically invest hundreds of millions of dollars, far more than it costs to make the original discoveries in the improvement and testing of a single drug uh, to gain relative uh, regulatory approval and bring it finally to market. Now, basic science, whose virtues I have just extolled, may be a cure-all for practical problems, but what relevance does it have to the broader purpose that brings us together today? Uh, what role does it, can it play in addressing social questions, such as human rights, or international peace, or other pressing issues that concern us all? Now, I'll make one comment in this regard, which is completely obvious and which is cited by many, but I can't fail to mention. Uh, science is a truly international activity. It is a marvelous example, um, as, as it has evolved over the past century, especially, of international cooperation. And I'd like to just mention that the majority of the young scientists in my own laboratory over the years, responsible for the work that was mentioned in the introduction, the majority of these young people have come not from the United States. They've come from Europe, they've come from Israel, many have come from Asia, they have come from Central and South America. And my laboratory is no exception in this regard. The findings made by these young scientists have been published in a literature which is accessible worldwide. It's available to be read, to be criticized, and for the results to be exploited worldwide. Now, it is sometimes noted that education is an important antidote to social problems, an antidote to hatred, to intolerance, and to other afflictions of society that concern us such a great deal. Uh, but education in general, knowledge, especially from basic science and in particular, is not sufficient, uh, is not alone prescription for social ills. Education is crucial, but there is something more required. And uh, I must tell you that the most learned society, perhaps, uh, in the history of humankind, the society of 20th century Germany, I would remind you, this learned group of people perpetrated the worst offense against humanity in all of history, the Holocaust. And what is more, more than half of the people who planned the mass murder of the Jews at the one Conference in 1941, more than half of them held doctoral degrees. So the product of scholarship, including science, will not alone protect us from such atrocities in the future. Something more is needed. And I think it is not science itself, but the culture of science, the nature of scientific activity, that may at least serve as a paradigm for addressing social problems. And that is because of what I've told you. Science seeks fundamental principles, and scientific truth when it, is, when it is discovered is universal. And I would suggest that by analogy, and I think the analogy is very close, societies are ultimately best sustained by the rule of law whose application depends on an, un an unbiased judiciary or other such body. In a world that is beset, as ours is, by irrational forces, science represents the light of reason. And in a similar way, Aristotle is quoted as saying, the rule of law is nothing less than the rule of reason. 
the rule of reason balanced by considerations of equity so that just results may be achieved. Another more recent statement since Aaron taught, Aaron's taught along similar lines was made by Alexander Hamilton, who was a soldier in the American War of Independence in the 1700s, and he was also one of those who wrote the American Constitution. Uh, he, can, he is quoted as having said, uh, a steady, upright, and impartial administration of the rule of law is essential because no man can be sure he will not tomorrow be the victim of a spirit of injustice by which he may benefit today. Science may not itself solve the world's problems, but the practice of science, the culture of science, the pursuit of universal truth can at least serve as a model, as a guide for doing so. Now, as many of you are aware, and I cannot fail to mention, the pursuit of fundamental truth is even older than Aristotle. Both Eastern and Western religions are founded on perceptions of truth and fundamental principles. Um, you know the example of perhaps the five precepts of Buddhism or the Ten Commandments of Judaism, remarkably similar in this regard, who arrived at independently by thinkers very long ago. Beyond a foundation on principle, both science and religion have a common purpose. They seek to explain the mysteries of our existence, the mysteries of our universe. Their purposes are similar, although the conclusions reached are often very different. Now, in this regard, I must, um, as an aside, remark um, how truly astonishing it is that we seek knowledge at all and have done so over the ages. Um, that we feel as human, as members of this species, impelled to do so. Humans will expend enormous energy to do so. People will take mortal risks and endure great suffering to gain knowledge. An obvious example, of course, is the exploration of the Earth and the exploration of outer space. I think the creation of art and literature is another example. An urge to explore is truly a part of human nature. As you know, exploration was a major factor in the evolution of our species. Uh, the goal of exploration is testing the limits of the possible and finding the knowledge that may lie beyond. The rewards are really personal. So clearly, we all possess an inherent desire to know, an urge to understand. And it's an urge that is common to science and religion. And as I've said, it is truly an expression the human spirit. I've told you that it's the overarching purpose of basic research, and now I emphasize that it's something very deeply ingrained. It comes very naturally to us. I think it's a motivation more powerful than greed or lust or any other. As I have said, it has led to life as we know. And though sometimes a source of evil, it can also be beneficial. As I have said, Pursuit of knowledge for its own sake is vital for our future, a source of progress. Now let me advance a second reason, and that is the pursuit of knowledge has an intrinsic value, that of intellectual activity. Truth has a certain objective purity. I might just mention that this urge that we all feel to know, to understand, um, has been encouraged by the great success uh, that people have accomplished in this direction. Um, others have remarked that no human capability is more remarkable than that of uh, understanding, of unraveling the mysteries of our existence, including our capabilities themselves. The question today is how far will these capabilities extend? I mean, already our explanations have gone beyond ordinary reason. Uh, cosmology, chemistry, biology can only be understood in terms of what are not straightforward, but rather abstract notions. Abstractions of energy, of scale, and of time. The behavior of matter at high energy is explained in terms of relativity. Not a straightforward notion, not a part of ordinary experience. The nature of matter on the atomic scale is described in terms of, in terms of quantum mechanics equally foreign to our common experience. And finally, evolution of the species is a reflection of geologic time, 
of time on a scale far beyond anything we can comprehend from our ordinary existence. And I thought I might illustrate the nature of this particular extraction with an example from my own research. As you've heard, I have studied uh, for the past very many years genetic information. You all know that genes perform a dual role. There are repository of information that's passed from parents uh, to their children. Um, they're at the same time the source of information uh, for the activity of every generation. They define the form and the function of every living thing. Now the first step in the use of genetic information is reading the information. And that is accomplished by a giant assemblage, many protein molecules. As you've heard, my colleagues and I over the past several decades obtained an image, derived an actual picture of this big assemblage in the very act of reading genetic information. The image shows the location of every one of 30,000 individual atoms involved in the process. The sum total of what we see is an actual machine, a minute, a molecular machine, but a true machine with moving parts that we can best describe as clamps, as jaws, as a rudder, as a lid, as a trigger, and so forth. It's a marvel of natural engineering and its intricacy and its remarkable capabilities present a problem really a challenge for understanding in terms of evolution. Nevertheless, it did arise by evolution over a period of geologic time, time so vast that we can scarcely imagine something that transcends our ordinary experience. Finally, in this regard, I might mention uh, people sometimes ask whether Understanding a fundamental process at this level, um, demystifying the process, as it were, in the case of, in the particular case that I've given, somehow grasping the power of geologic time, um, may in some way diminish the wonder of nature. Um, but on the contrary, I think one is even more awestruck by the grandeur and by the beauty. It's a sense of awe that can evoke a truly spiritual response. Einstein once wrote, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead, a snuffed out candle. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced, there is something that our minds cannot grasp, whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly, this is religiousness, and in this sense, I am a religious man. The same sense of awe that Einstein described can engender, I think, a belief in the power of reason and ultimately the rule of law. Many of us engaged in work such as I have briefly outlined for you share a conviction that I already mentioned that every mystery of nature will ultimately succumb to explanation in chemical or physical terms. But of course we can't know that this is true because we haven't explained all the mysteries of nature. It's an article of faith and it will continue to be an article of faith until, if ever, we finally succeed. Lastly, I might say the pursuit of understanding, which I have told you, reflects a primal urge, um, is an object of great personal satisfaction. The pursuit of science is a joy. The key to success in science is the love of it. It's not that the work is always fun, it's not always pleasurable, it's most often a struggle and most things we do fail. But occasional progress is exhilarating and that's what leads us on. So in all of its aspects of faith, of passion, 
and the quest for a larger meaning, science resembles religion. At the deepest level, both science and religion are, as I have said, reflections of our humanity. Where science does depart from religion, of course, is its foundation on objective or what we call verifiable truth. That, I think, is a, a, an important component of its appeal, at least to me. And that is what it offers to society, as I have said, as a paradigm where the law of reason and the, 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 the uh, rule of law and an unbiased judiciary play a crucial role. Finally, let's just let me summarize. I've told you basic science is literally a bridge to understanding nature and ultimately to the practical benefits and the, per and the personal fulfillment that follow. At the same time, I've told you that basic science is a figurative bridge to the, so the solution of societal problems through the example it sets of reason, of rationality, and of impartial or objective analysis. Science leads directly to technical progress. The culture of science, the example of science, may lead, although indirectly, towards the peace we so much desire and a universal understanding. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my question is about you know, um, I totally agree with your idea of actually um, we should actually um, retain local talents and also um, support young scientists. Um, <laughs> my question is that, you know, uh, it is a, it's a trend right nowadays uh, in Asia to hire top scientists from Europe and the States. Um, so I wonder whether um, that, uh, that idea is sustainable, in a sense, for Asian countries, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like actually ask you about comments. I, what you have uh, just observed is indeed uh, the case, but the numbers of uh, leaders from abroad who have been brought to places uh, that I'm familiar with, it's, you know, the number of such people recruited, for example, to uh, universities in Singapore. I myself am on the faculty of a university in Korea. And uh, I think that those numbers will uh, never be large, but the role they play may be nonetheless important. Uh, the majority of positions, the vast majority, virtually all academic positions, uh, will doubtless one day be occupied by young people such as yourself. Uh, but to jumpstart the process, uh, to um, help guide at a time when there are not, uh, when there is not a previous uh, generation with the experience um, of, in many cases, in science in the way that it is uh, formed by the individuals to whom you allude, um, it is worthwhile to bring them. Uh, they will probably not stay forever. Uh, they uh, will not be able to solve all of the problems that confront you. But I think that they do have a role to play. Uh, and that one can very much benefit uh, from their occasional participation. Bear in mind that it's a two-way street. Um, that their coming will result also in offering opportunities for young people such as yourselves uh, to spend some time in laboratories in American European countries uh, where uh, many things can be learned and brought back. So I don't think the scale of this um, involvement and this recruitment of people from abroad um, poses a threat or a challenge. Um, I would almost say the reverse, that one of the things that has invigorated American laboratories has been competition for positions for young people from abroad. Um, in, in the same way as American industry, which was once almost dead, has been sustained, has been reinvigorated by competition from 
many countries around the world, including the Asian countries. Um, so our science benefits from competition. Um, I refer to a marketplace of talent and ideas, um, and I think an international marketplace is in the best interest of all. Thank you. I have set. I have several questions. Uh, my name is Aida. Well, actually, when you say basic science, well, most people don't know what is. I mean, when we, we say basic science, we don't really want to do. I mean, application. For example, I like science, but I want to see my. Um, I mean, my knowledge that I can contribute to. I mean, to human. Okay. What my first question? What is the uh, criteria that you need to have? If let's say you want to be a scientist, because not everyone can be a scientist. So, I mean, you are a scientist, so what are the criteria that you need to have patience or knowledge? And In the first place, each individual, every one of you, um, should follow his or her own inclinations for everything you need. Um, science takes many forms, and uh, while I made uh, a plea for the pursuit and the support of uh, basic science, which, as I say, can be defined as pursuit of knowledge for its own sake and without any interest in application. There is an important place, perhaps a predominant place, for those who wish to take the next step, exploit information that is available, and apply it uh, to medical or other problems. There is, um, there are many more scientists employed in industry with that aim than there are scientists employed in academic institutions. And their role is no less important. Um, I think the problem, and the reason why I stress the need for basic science, is that it is less obvious. And it it's often neglected. Uh, the second question, uh, for example, uh, to be a scientist, you need to have skills. I mean, of course, uh, you ha you have talent, but how, for example, um, how about you cannot be a leader. And, I mean, you have to have skills. I mean, you have to do hands-on. So, my question is, um, how can, well, for example, Malaysia or Thailand, we want to have a scientist, but unfortunately, most of the young scientists I, I, this is what, um, from my experience, they don't have the opportunity to continue doing these skills. I mean, after you did your PhD, you, uh, if let's say you want to be a scientist, you need to have knowledge, you, have, you need to have skills, and so on. I mean, if let's say there's no institution that can provide this, how can you be a scientist? So, I mean, how to avoid to to, uh, to solve this problem, I mean, from your experience. So, there is no question that to succeed <laughs> in science, either the discovery of knowledge or its application, you need knowledge of techniques, and you need facilities. Uh, as um, invariably uh, are required to apply those techniques. Now, there was a time when um, learning techniques required uh, going to distant places where they were invented and where the facilities were not generally available. Um, from my limited observation in Malaysia, there are excellent facilities now in um, university laboratories. Um, knowledge of the techniques can be gained either from literature or uh, from the involvement of people who may come for some time, for some time from abroad who are experts, or uh, increasingly nowadays opportunities for uh, travel by young people such as yourself for a limited time training in a place where they can look at these practice. Now, all of that said, let me emphasize what matters more. Um, the crucial thing is the pursuit of a problem. The crucial thing is to set as a goal, set your mind on addressing a scientific problem. Chain and Flory wanted to understand the role of lysozyme in the structure of the bacterial cell wall. It could be anything else, whatever uh, catches 
burn your stop, your fancy. You follow the problem wherever it may be. When you realize at some point that a particular technique is required, then you find a way to acquire it. If some instrumentation is necessary, you find a place where it is available. If you follow the problem, then your work will be focused. The requirements for your work will be real but limited uh, and achievable. It's the most important thing always uh, to concentrate on an assignment question or an issue um, and let that dictate the path of the Okay, uh, I, I think let's let's have some comments from, yes, Dato. Uh, I would just like to emphasize that, as you said, science is universal. It doesn't change from one part of the world to the other. It is verifiable. And how is it? Politics, which is also a science, is so very different, not only from one part of the world to the other, but even within one country. So uh, this, of course, is the thing that afflicts us all. <laughs> and uh, certainly uh, your own thoughts or suspicions along those lines are as is the little, perhaps even more stupid than my own. Um, I can only appeal to one thing, and that is uh, what I think is, has got to be both the bedrock of society and our only hope in the very long and uh, we hope not too far distant future. And that is, um, first, a rule of law in which all can participate in the form to which all may subscribe. Secondly, it's just application. I think that um, there may be there are very many other requirements for society, but nothing so nothing more fundamental. But if you like, it is right at that point where virtually all of our societies fail or break down to some extent. The uh, there is no greater political ill than corruption, and corruption reflects a failure of the rule of law and its application. I think all here would agree that if there were no corruption in politics, very many other things would be possible. Again, that isn't to say it's the only thing, but it is clearly a rule of and a key concern for us all. Um, can I not be heard in the back? Thank you, Professor Kronberg. I'm a student of literature and also a student of the process of poetic creation. In literature, the moment of discovery is when a word flashes through your mind and this word extends in its meaning and encompasses an idea. Then you have a poem. I was wondering what is or how would you describe the moment of discovery in the sciences? Is it the moment of awe that Einstein was describing in your quotation. Thank you. So I think the best, I mean, I think I know exactly what it is you're asking, and I think I can, though I'm not a poet, I think I can understand uh, what it is that you mean. I can understand the experience to which you refer. And uh, I imagine that I speak for other scientists in the audience here when I answer. Uh, the, the, the moment of discovery in science is a moment of connection. Uh, it's a point where previously unrelated facts or observations are suddenly seen uh, to be directly connected to one another. Could otherwise be described as a moment of understanding. What is understanding? That's not so easy to put in words, but something I think we uh, all know at some level. Discovery uh, can be uh, the perception of something that didn't exist before, such as penicillin, or it can be grasping uh, a solution to a problem, like the solution of a math mathematical problem that eluded us before. 
best I can do in a few words. <laughs> okay. Uh, give a yeah. Uh, very good evening, uh, afternoon to me. Yeah, I'm full from School of Chemical Sciences. Uh, as a fact that a lot of the young talents, especially scientists, that go to America's students, they retain at the countries, the, the foreign countries. So what uh, suggestions or comments that you can maybe provide to the Vice Chancellor or the government <laughs> that to retain back the young talents in Malaysia? So the, the question of facilities can be addressed in a number of ways. Uh, in my own work, it may surprise you to know, not only did not require over a period of very many years, and with one exception, any very sophisticated facility, in fact, uh, I, I, I did not, over a period of almost 30 years, ever purchase with the funds made available to me by the government um, an item of equipment at all. I used to borrow facilities from my neighbors. Um, one of the most important items for our work was a fermenter for growing large quantities of yeast from which we extracted the proteins we studied. Uh, we acquired our fermenter when it was being discarded in the 1970s by another group. And then my students were skillful in maintaining it. They were uh, good at fixing their own cars and they could also repair the fermenter. We could never afford to buy one. Uh, now, you may not have a neighbor who's about to discard a fermenter. Uh, so that may be a concern. My point is only that uh, uh, those are practical problems and there are ways around them. And uh, if you wanted to make a proposal to your vice chancellor, one of the things that I have seen done successfully uh, in countries where facilities or funds for equipment are more limited is to create single central facilities. It may not be possible for every individual laboratory to possess the wherewithal for doing the research, as is very often the case in well-funded laboratories, for example, in America. But collectively, one may have access at least to one item of equipment that is essential uh, for pursuing the work. Now, again, in my limited observation here, just in the time in a couple of days that I've been in Malaysia and touring some laboratories, I've been impressed. The uh, state-of-the-art equipment, for many purposes, is or can be available. Um, the cost of such items, uh, when spread over the use by very many laboratories, is not prohibitive. Question for me. Um, hi. Um, I wonder um, from the from the introduction, you were. Uh, I learned that you were a, a trained chemist, trained as a chemist. Then um, somehow, um, as you know, you won the Nobel Nobel Prize uh, for solving problems in biology. Um, so um, I, I I wonder whether you know the risk you take from being a chemist. Uh, then you switch. Uh, feel to biology, um, would, it, would you actually advise young scientists to do such things as well? Thank you. So there are actually two answers to your question, which is an interesting one. The, uh, the solution to a problem in biology that came out of my work was entirely chemical. Uh, we solved the biological problem in physical and chemical terms using primarily methods from photon physics. Um, so that is doubtless the reason why the Nobel Committee for Chemistry, rather than medicine or physiology, was the one uh, to recognize our work. But to more uh, directly address your question, um, there's something very important that lies at the heart of what you asked, uh, and that is about the very nature of discovery and the way it is accomplished. Discovery unavoidably involves risk-taking. So, you, as I have emphasized, uh, as I repeated several times in the course of this lecture, discoveries can't be anticipated. You can't propose to a granting agency, you can't propose to the administration of your university that you're going to make a discovery. Therefore, they should support your work. You have to propose something which um, would seem reasonable and appropriate for them to support. And then, 
as we do in America all the time, depart from the promised line of research because of an idea you may have or a lead that arises from your work that you wish to follow, which may take you far afield of the stated purpose of your research. You have to take risks and um, only when you do so is there a chance they will be rewarded by genuine discovery. Please. Thanks, Prof, for your very enlightening uh, lecture. I've got some, one, just one question, nothing to do with science, but it's more of encounters. Some of us, I think, had the good fortune to meet your late father. And now you, both of you, are very august and honorable scientists. But we also sense the tremendous amount of humility that you've got and also your father's. My question is, uh, what drives humility and what has humility got to do with the search for knowledge or science? Thanks. I think it's a great question and I think it's an appropriate place to finish because it is the humility before nature which those who struggle to understand it unavoidably particularly possess. I think uh, what Einstein said uh, is an example of why one must not only be humble, but feel humbled even by the progress of one's work and ultimately the success of the pursuit. I think humility lies at the basis of the honesty that is required to succeed in science. I think that if you don't deeply feel and truly grasp your own limitations in these regards, if you don't uh, feel, in every sense, humble before the challenge of the science you pursue, then you have no chance of succeeding. Uh, and so again, as I would emphasize, uh, I actually started out as an arrogant young man. <laughs> I thought I could do everything and anything. Uh, and uh, am continually uh, made to realize the folly of that and ever more, I would say, humble in the face of nature as I pursue her secrets. Uh, thank you, Prof. Kornberg. I think uh, certainly it has been a privilege to hear something such great diversity, but more of a convergence with regards to humility science, and perhaps religion. Uh, on that note, please join me once again to thank uh, Professor Kornberg uh, for the talk this afternoon. Uh, I, I will now hand, hand over the, the mic to uh, our MC for a few other details. Thank you.